Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Responsible Innovation 100. Today, we have Joshua Ross, who is the co-founder and CEO of Humanitix based in Sydney, Australia. Now, Josh, I actually first discovered Humanitix when I attended the event through Humanitix, and I really loved your vision and purpose. I kind of always had your company on the back of my mind for a very long time, so I'm very excited to have you with us. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, thanks. Um, and thanks for having me. So uh, yeah, I grew up in Sydney, Australia. I teamed up with my best mate, Adam, about six, seven years ago, and we co-founded Humanitix together. But yeah, I grew up in Sydney, went to school here, uh, studied finance, worked in that industry for seven years before doing the Humanitix thing, which we'll get to. Been really lucky, did a bit of backpacking when I was a university student, which made me think a bit differently and exposed me to other cultures and, and kind of really gave me this, this bug that I wanted to do something unconventional with my life and my time. And uh, yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell. I love hiking, swimming, outdoors. <laughs> I'm getting married in September. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, Congratulations. that'd be exciting. And we're doing a festival wedding. So oh, really? that'll be a bit different. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, okay, so you see on you might, your wedding you might through Humanitics as well? Or? Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> But uh, we've got a client who runs festivals up the coast and uh, she owns her own property and she's told me I can get married on it. So, uh, so yeah, we're going to do a two-night camping type of bush stuff festival wedding. Which wow, be yeah. unconventional. So cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that sounds very exciting. So uh, I would like to start our interview with a bit of a broad brush just to get into your mindset. We are in a period of profound change, right? So on one hand, we have all these societal grand challenges. And on the other hand, we have all these new technologies coming, emerging and converging at the same time. So which trends do you find most interesting or worrying at the moment? So I think there's definitely a trend in business towards recognizing that the customer is looking for social impact. And so whether that's investing ethically, if you look at index funds, which are a massive investment product for everyone. There's been massive flows of funds into what are called ESG funds in the last few years. If you look at consumer brands, all these big consumer brands were slapping Black Lives Matter on their marketing material. But as far as I could tell, a lot of them do nothing to advance affairs for people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds or people of color. Uh, or if they do, it's a very minuscule element of what they do. And uh, I think that's all in recognition of this trend where consumers are looking to be more socially conscious. And I think that's an amazing trend, but it's also a worrying trend because I think it's very easy to trick the customer. It's very easy to greenwash is a term that's thrown around where a business puts a bit of its marketing budget into making itself look environmentally friendly, but actually isn't. And very few people take the time to do the due diligence to understand whether something's really genuine or the saying is slapping lipstick on a pig and so I think that's a really exciting trend but also a worrying trend because you often don't do their homework and then to your other point like obviously technology is leading to rapid change in a range of industries and it seems quicker than any other time in history and so I think that's a great opportunity but also a great risk and so you're seeing a lot of thought leadership starting to emerge in AI as to a the opportunities but b the risks for humanity and the biases within artificial intelligence. And um, yeah, so there's a lot going on in the space of technology that is potentially good, but potentially bad as well. You say a particular innovation or trend that you think would have the most impact on human progress? Yeah, it's a big question. I think uh, climate change is definitely the most worrying trend with respect to like major impact for humanity. So is nuclear risk, although that's not talked about as much at the moment but definitely in the last century it has been. Our ability to wipe ourselves out. I don't think climate change will wipe us out, but it's definitely going to impact us significantly over the next century, it looks like. So I've really been enjoying listening to your interviews um, and how you've kind of transitioned your career from when you were young. I think in one of your interviews, you said when you were young, you were working in fast food restaurants. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, a Portuguese chicken shop, the brand's Nando's, people in Sydney might know it. But yeah, I was flipping burgers in the back and scrubbing dishes. It's my first proper job. <laughs> From there, obviously, you progressed and then you became a funds manager. 
before you started humanetics, right? I'm curious in terms of what led to your decision to leave, you know, a full-time well-paying job to do something that's completely different because I imagine you would have taken a lot of courage to actually take the leap. Yeah, it's kind of funny that it does take a lot of courage because on paper it's not that scary, but in reality it is. So what I mean by that is, you know, I grew up in Sydney. For those I don't know if the audience is all going to be Australian or global, but Australia is one of the luckiest countries in the world. Free education, free health. Uh, you can't starve to death in Sydney. I, I, I'm lucky that I come from a, a good family that that are you know that is a safety net for me. Mm-hmm. And so, why is it so courageous for me to to, <laughs> to trade tracks in my career and, and you know not prioritize making as much money as I can? I don't. I think people make much more courageous decisions all t- all the time. But for some reason, that is that like a lot of people don't leave their career path because of fear, but I think it's an irrational fear if you live in a country like Australia, where, um, especially if you're young and don't have dependents yet. Mm. But uh, yeah, so, I mean, I kind of uh, came to that realization in my early 20s um, when traveling. I lived at home when I studied at university and I, I worked the whole time and I saved my money to, to see the world. And so I went and really cheaply backpacked for two years. Um, and, uh, and it gave me the perspective that allowed me to say, hey, you know what, I'm really lucky in this world. And if I don't use that luck to spend my time doing the things that matter to me, that's a real shame. To me, that's the bigger risk if I don't spend my time on things that matter to me. So yeah, I kind of felt obliged to, to at least roll the dice and try. And then I was very fortunate to have Adam as my best friend and co-founder, because I think it, even then it was still irrationally scary to do. <laughs> um, but having someone else to do it with made that a lot uh, easier. So I have a lot of respect for entrepreneurs that step out on their own. Um, it's um, it, it's so much darker a journey in those first stages if you're on your own. Hmm. You use the word obliged, which is super interesting because, you know, like you said before, a lot of people dream about making impact, but they never really take the step. Those who do actually take the step often have um, a vision or a bigger sense of responsibility than just living life for themselves. Have you always felt this way or did some sort of experience teach you how important it is to actually be an agent of positive change? Yeah, it's a great question. So I grew up in like a, um, with a bit of a religious influence, particularly from my mother. And so I, I don't know how much of that, that, I mean, that was drilled into me young. And with that came, you know, some of the nicer attributes of religion, which are around community, giving back, in Judaism, there's a concept called tzedakah, which is charity in, in the simplest form. I always felt a duty to be a good human being, essentially. But uh, it was definitely, a, 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 you know, a lot of moments in life that kind of set you on the trajectory you're on. I read a book at university called Banker to the Ball by a, um, an amazing person called Muhammad Yunus. He invented microfinance as a way to help poor people get out of poverty. And that was a big book for me to read, big inspiration. So was Peter Singer with A Life You Can Save. For those who aren't familiar with the effective altruism movement, that also shaped my thinking quite a lot in my early 20s. But yeah, I was always somewhat idealistic. That's not to say I wasn't selfish growing up and making mistakes and, you know, on a day-to-day human ways, incredibly selfish, but I always wanted to point my career towards doing something positive for the world. Mm. This leads to my next question about humanities, how you finally landed on your current company. What made you consider redirecting revenue from ticket sales to support education? I know you do yeah. a few things, but education. Well, why ticket sales? That's the first part. And why education? The second part. Yeah, sure. So for those who don't know, Humanitix is an event ticketing platform. So if you're an event organizer selling tickets to your 10-person yoga workshop or your conference or your gala dinner or your music festival or your speaker series or your school events, whatever it might be, you can go to humanitix.com, create a free account, build an event with our software and start selling tickets online to it. And, you know, this platform gives you all the features you need to promote your event, market your event, seating maps, different ticket types, discount codes, you name it, anything you need for an event. And, um, and like any other ticketing platform, there's a booking fee. Ours are really low. So if you're a non-for-profit, we let you use our platform at a sustainable cost price, which is the cheapest on the market. If you're a for-profit, we still have low fees. 
but we charge closer to market rate and the profit of those fees are what allow us to fund indigenous scholarships and literacy programs for young girls and do cool things like solve accessibility. It's grown really quickly because why wouldn't you use that? It costs you nothing extra and it makes the world a really better place. And so that's kind of the model. And so my co-founder, Adam, he's got a background in, in technology. He studied engineering, was a management consultant at Accenture in the technology practice. And I was in funds management, investing in companies. And the best companies of the last two decades have pretty much all been tech companies. Um, the Amazons, Facebooks, Netflixes of the world, you name it. It's software generally, or Apple, it's still tech companies. And so we recognize the biggest driver of change in the for-profit world is technology. So we thought you know, it's accruing more wealth and wealth is power. It's also literally changing the world through its technological innovation more than any other industry we can see. So if we can wield that for good, then that's probably the most powerful force out there to try and tap into. So then it became an exercise of trying to work out in the technology sector, what could we disrupt for good? What was right for disruption? We landed on event ticketing for a range of reasons, but one is everyone hates booking fees. And the incumbents in that industry are notorious for charging excessive fees and having terrible customer service. And to be frank, not doing much good for the world, just, you know, stereotypical business that's not nice to deal with. And so I thought, great, if we come in there and act ethically, that's going to be a really strong point of difference. Also, what's nice about it is it's a multi-billion dollar growing industry. It's global and most events are recurring in nature. And it's genuine software these days. You don't get a physical ticket for the vast majority of events you buy a ticket to. And so it kind of hit that sweet spot. And then we also discovered that in event ticketing, there's a massive social issue of inclusion for people with disabilities. If you speak to people with, you know, serious disabilities, like that might be legally blind or severely vision impaired or hearing impaired or, or whatever it might be, they, they generally give up going to live events because they have a horrible time getting access to the information they need to attend with confidence. Or maybe they can't get the information they need because the website is not vision accessible for their screen reader. So there's all these technical innovations within that. We recognize that that's an awesome social issue to fix with technology. And so it kind of ticked a lot of boxes. And we thought, great, this is a start on our vision and we can disrupt the event ticketing industry for good. The second half of your question was around education. Why education? Yeah. Cool. I mean, for me and Adam, on a personal level, like it was a recognition of we wouldn't be anywhere without our education. We wouldn't be able to do this without our education. And the world's greatest asset is human capital being people and their brains. And the more we can help the poorest people in the world get access to a quality education, the more likely we will get more brilliant minds helping the world. And that's our best strategy for solving social problems especially you can layer ethics and values with that education that are good for the world. You know, the numbers moving around, but the last number I saw was 130 million children worldwide who don't get an education, which is crazy when you think about how wealthy our world has become. For us, it, it just meant a lot. It, it made sense. It's hard to measure. It's hard to, but, but you know, a lot of things are hard to measure. It doesn't mean they're not worth doing. We focus on literacy and life skills for young girls in low-income countries in Australia and New Zealand, we focus on Aboriginal kids and Torres Strait Islander kids. For those who don't know our history, the most disadvantaged on pretty much every well-being metric there is and a shocking history. If we can create a merit meritocratic baseline of, of human education, that it's it's really an enabler of humanity going forward. Mm. And so that yeah, there's a, and then there's other things like when you educate young girls and keep them in school, it's actually one of the best things you can do for the environment. Um, they're more likely to have a sustainably a sustainable family. Hmm. I suppose here lies the important lesson in terms of how to choose how you can approach making the most impact with your skill set. What's your philosophy? There's also practical reasons we have an education mandate at Humanitics. For mm -hmm. me personally, like my philosophy on like, if me, Josh Ross, as an individual is going to give the charity, I'm going to be guided by the effective altruism philosophy. And for those who don't know it, I highly recommend reading two books. One is A Life You Can Save by Peter Singer. The other one is Doing Good Better by William McCaskill. And the, to summarize it crudely, <laughs> um, effective altruism is the idea that uh, you, for, for limited philanthropic resources we have, we should put them not to things that make us feel warm and fuzzy, but towards things that create the most social impact per dollar given. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, an example would be, um, say your value set is such that animal welfare is the most important thing to you then you might give to your local animal shelter. And that's a lovely thing to do. 
but it's not necessarily the most effective thing to do. Mm -hmm. For example, there was, uh, and I might butcher this story, but there's a, there's a uh, animal charity in, in France that worked out that when they're taking eggs, they don't yet know if it's a male or female and they want the females to lay eggs. And so they wait till they hatch and the males get crushed and the females are taken away. And for like some ridiculous amount, like a cent per egg, you can work out whether they're a male or female much earlier in the journey and not have to go down that. And so this animal charity lobbied for regulatory change that everyone in the industry would have to factor that in. Didn't affect the consumer because it's such a low cost, but none of the actors would do it until everyone had to do it. Mm -hmm. And so for like a very small amount of money, you saved tens, if not hundreds of millions of animals from that cruel fate. The number of lives you can save for a dollar is very different across different charities for the same cause areas. And so it's really that philosophy of trying to think rationally about how you give as opposed to emotionally giving, you know, what you touch and feel and makes you feel warm and fuzzy. In the same way as when you invest, you know, people are diligent in how, the way they invest their money to make a return. We need the world of philanthropy to think that way as well. So what made you actually choose to set up as, as a charity rather than, say, a, social, a for profit social enterprise? Yeah, so a couple of things. We wanted to go into a structure that we would thought would maximize the impact. And so we were open-minded as to whether that would be best served as a for-profit or a non-for-profit. We then took the view that if we got this right in the ticketing industry, it'd be incredibly, incredibly powerful economically. Say we estimated at the start that we need five to $10 million of investment capital to get this idea to where we want it to get to. If we could do it as a charity, then we need that in grant money. Probably a bit less because we'd get some stuff for free along the way as a charity. <laughs> but um, if this works, we're going to be giving hundreds of millions of dollars to these projects over the next decades, maybe billions. And what a shame if only 10% of that goes to these projects because in the very early days, we couldn't access a bit of philanthropy to get this flywheel going. And so we thought the long-term impact of this will be much better served as a charity if we can prove that as a charity you can do this, i.e. can we convince philanthropists to back a model like this? Can we attract high caliber talent when we can't give equity to our staff and probably can't pay as well as for-profit competitors? And it's an experiment in compassionate capitalism. Can we, can we do this as a charity? It's been really challenging because we at least feel like we're trailblazing in that sense. We don't know of other technology charities in the world that are scaling like this. There aren't many people in the world that will fund an idea like this because it's different. Mm -hmm. And so it's been challenging but rewarding because it's worked in Australia and New Zealand and the jury's still out in America, but it's worked in Australia and New Zealand and it will have a lot more impact because it's a charity now because all of the profits will be going to our projects. Well, often you hear that founders who are approaching things from a different angle, they have a hard time at the start in terms of trying to convince other people and explaining their idea in terms of why they have approached their business in certain ways. And how did you learn to tell your story and what has been the response? Has it always been good? Has, has it been difficult? Um, mixed. It's always been mixed and it still is mixed. Part of the challenge in the early days was the idea stacked up. It was financially feasible. It was, you know, the strategy was right. We haven't had to really change the strategy, to be honest. But myself and Adam, Adam was an uh, engineering background. I was a finance background. Neither of us are marketing. <laughs> and so when you look at our pitch decks from 2016 to philanthropists, they looked like a, a funds management presentation. They didn't look like a charity presentation. And so we weren't pulling on the heartstrings of funders. We were saying, hey, look at this. It makes sense. This is why this is the smartest thing you can fund philanthropically and will have all this awesome impact for the world. As opposed to, here's a photo of this child who hasn't had access to an education and this is her personal story. How, how bad do you feel now? Can we have some money? <laughs> Which um, <laughs> I'm being facetious in the way I'm delivering it, but like that actually works and the former doesn't. Like the cold hard facts and numbers don't unless you're appealing to someone's investment mind. And we weren't. We were asking them for philanthropic money. So it took us a while to get that balance right. And to be honest, we never quite got the balance right. We still sell. We still, when we're pitching to say the Atlassian Foundation, which are our major partner, it's looking at the impact and the numbers. And luckily they're a very rational counterparty. But, you know, a lot of philanthropy is driven by emotion and we don't have any of that backing us. 
and we've missed a big part of the philanthropic pie because that is a lot of it. Um, we're outside their mandates and we don't appeal to that sense. And so we don't raise money from the public, for example, because it's not a, you know, people usually give publicly based on emotions. Mm. If I looked at your website though, because because what really engaged me was actually looking at your your website, and I thought because I come from marketing, so not from finance, so for me I thought it's actually quite inspiring Thank to you. see to see a company who's um, approaching an issue with a from a different angle, you know. So it, it's it's just um, I'm surprised actually for you to hear that you think you are missing the marketing storytelling side. We've because... gotten much better in the last 12 months because <laughs> we've brought some people on that have helped us with oh, that. Right. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the, what the customer sees as an event organizer is quite different to what a philanthropist sees and is interested in. Hmm. And so that's more of a private discussion. Hmm. But um, yeah, our website's come a long way through like, it's it, the brand looks, I think, amazing. And their team's done a really good job. But hmm. until recently, that was... um. Yeah, it was like an amateur job on the branding. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move on to the next section. Um, and you actually touched on this a little bit before in terms of how you approach product design and making your platform more inclusive. One of the key challenges for founders is that they have a grand vision, but to translate their grand vision into daily actions is actually quite difficult. How did you go about developing your vision? And how did you translate that vision into say your culture and the way that you developed designed your platform vision was developed over years of me and adam's friendship and you know we 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 became friends straight out of high school and so we've been friends for about 15 years now and we've lived together we've traveled together (laughs) we've literally spent so much time together it's honestly the culmination of over a decade of conversations as a friend of what do you want to do with your time? What matters to you? How interesting is this idea? Well, that's a bad idea because of these reasons. Really engaging in the philosophy of why we're here. That allowed us to think how we want to spend our time, which from that we derived the vision. And then the hard part is actually working on how you execute on the vision. We were in our mid-20s, kind of knew the direction we wanted to go in, but we didn't have a good idea. We were in jobs we didn't enjoy. And we were drifting into a career we didn't find meaningful. And so we decided to double down and, and meet up two, three nights a week for like two, three hours, like put pen to paper and actually really start working on it as opposed to just intellectualizing it. And um, we realized it was going to stay a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> unless one of us went full time. And you had the desperation of, well, I've got to make something work because I now don't have an income. I don't have a job. And so at the end of 2015, um, we were dabbling with different ideas, different tech ideas that we thought could have massive impact at scale. Ticketing wasn't the first idea we came up with. I can't remember who raised it, but we were like, yeah, one of us has to go full-time and it made sense for Adam to go full-time at the moment time. Also because he had the technology background. And so on a handshake, we shared my salary for 16 months and we both moved back to our parents' places. And he started turning our PowerPoint into a, into a real thing. And I'd help him as much as I could, but I was confined to weeknights and weekends because I had a full-time job. And so that's kind of how we took the vision aspect into actually executing. And then I don't know how detailed you want me to go on the execution because where do I start? I think um, we've built the world's first charity that does ticketing. And so we've had to deal with all the problems that come with that with in terms of building a, a piece of software from scratch, working out what your clients want, hiring software developers, hiring sales team, hiring account managers, improving your brand, raising capital, like every challenge you have and starting something from scratch with the added extra challenge of not being able to attract investors. I don't think I could have done that with anyone else in the world. Um, Me and Adam are such tight friends. We literally shared my income for 16 months and worked from his parents' place. And we got to about 12 staff working from his parents' place. So he's like a brother as much as anything else. I don't know if that answers your latter half of your question, but that's how we did it. (laughs) Say, for example, you know, if you said, inclusivity is very important for the organization that's part of my values for the organization how did you then translate that say when you are making product design decisions or recruiting for people uh, uh, do you look at those things do you align your vision throughout your organization yeah that's actually more of a, a thing we spend more time on today than we did at the start 
Because the reality is at the start, we had no money. And so we had some crazy people join us along the way, but but they were choosing us, not us choosing them. Mm -hmm. And we were so desperate for help that you weren't really in a position to say no. So like, for example, our our first employee, James, he saw me talk at a tiny little social impact event and he contacted us two weeks later to say, hey guys, I heard your pitch. It's like the first thing I've seen at one of these events that made sense to me and that I think can go somewhere. I'd love to join. And we're like, cool, man. Thank you so much for that lovely compliment. We're probably going to fail, but yeah, thanks for jumping on the board. Thanks for believing in us. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, but we can't pay you because we don't even pay ourselves yet and we have no equity. So like, I don't know what we can say to you. And he's like, all right, well, I'll move back to my parents too and get a bar job on the weekends and start working full time for free as a volunteer and did that for about four months. A lot of the first people that joined us were like that. They'd come into the office, which was Adam's parents' place and his parents would be there. His grandfather, who's 90 odd, odd years would be there his family dog would be there <laughs> and so it's a totally different culture when you're go, walking into that type of experience and so it's a very family vibe it's very non-hierarchical and that that's scaled so far but we're only at 35 people so you know it gets harder as you get bigger now we're at a stage where like yeah when you join humanities it's a full-time paid position and it's probably pretty close to market rate and you know, there's awesome benefits of working here. And so you do have to think more about it because when, you know, someone like a James comes along, they're really living their values and the sacrifices they're willing to make to join this mission. And they're already aligned with your mission. Where now it's a bit harder because it's just a good sales role, just a good, you know, we're hiring right now for a content manager. Mm-hmm. And we're going to get a lot of applicants who are just looking for jobs and aren't necessarily bought into what we're doing. And we don't necessarily want that. When you apply for a role at Humanitics, you go through a bunch of technical interviews that assess whether you're the right person for the role. And then you go through about six cultural interviews where you meet people from all different departments at Humanitics to work out, are you mission aligned? And so we, we take it really seriously and we take a bit longer to recruit because of that. But pretty much no one's ever left. <laughs> so there's been one or two people for, that are you know still very close to us. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we haven't, we've been really lucky. A lot of the people that have joined us are, you know, they say their life is like they're just so happy here and so fulfilled. So it sounds like values and culture is much more important than the technical skills. Yeah, I mean, most of the stuff here can be done or learned and learned on the job. And so our CTO has no degree. You know, our best performing salesperson for the last 12 months has no degree. Mm-hmm. Our chief of staff is a lawyer. She does nothing at work that's legal or barely anything. Like she's just a jack of all trades journalist now. And she much prefers it. If someone's willing to check their ego at the door and drop the, you know, title that they think they deserve and, and just do what the organization needs to change the world, then, you know, it's usually attitude and matters more than predefined skill sets. Having said that in software developer, you wouldn't take on someone who's never coded before. Certain things like that where you want to see someone's genuinely passionate about what they do as well as your cause area. So maybe this question is not yet relevant, perhaps more relevant for larger organizations. You did mention before that just because something is hard to measure, it doesn't mean it's not important. Sometimes the most important things are other things that are hard to measure, right? So things like cultural values and attitudes. What kind of metrics do you use at the moment to measure either product success or organizational success? Or is this something that you prefer not to do? No, no, that's great questions. For some areas we do measure and for others we don't have quantitative KPIs. And so at the scale of culture, we don't have cultural KPIs. What we do measure is um, a range of things. And so our philanthropists and and multi-year partners, like the Atlassian Foundation, we've got agreed metrics with them that we track. And so they're wanting to understand, is the idea working, which is a function of our event organizers using us? Are they staying with us? Are they, what are we selling a year from that? What we're selling, how much are we able to make for our education programs sustainably? What's that growth trajectory look like? And are we hitting the budgets that we've agreed with them? And so, you know, there's that whole layer of financial management and metrics and um, impact measurement. Those are kind of the main ones. And so off that financial success flows our social impact for our education programs. Um, the one that's also really hard to measure is accessibility. So like we have amazing anecdotes around accessibility and the difference we're making there. Pretty much all the disability groups now use us because we're the only registration platform that is accessible. Just two weeks ago, we had a lady from Victoria, Melbourne, who is, I'm pretty sure, legally blind. And she wrote to us to say, thank you so much. I just ran my first event on your platform, and I used your app to scan people at the door. It's the first time I've ever been able to do that independently, not have someone who can see ticking off the list for me. 
And so our, our platform is not just accessible to buy tickets there. It's actually, we have people with disabilities using our platform to run their events and for the first time in their life, being able to do it independently. Mm. And so we haven't invested in measuring that because we don't know how we could measure that clearly. We're not going to ask everyone who buys a ticket on our platform, hey, do you happen to be legally blind? <laughs> if so, ch check the stick box. Like you can't do that as a UX customer experience. So what you do on that is you do design workshops with disability groups and, and, and you learn and you implement best practice. And you. And we've got a few big disability group partners who help us uh, innovate in that space and, and release things. But that can be very hard to measure the social impact of ultimately. For those people who have never used humanities before, can you actually walk through and explain to me how, say, a legally blind person might use your, use your platform? Yeah, sure. So initially, we thought of it as, cool, I'm blind, I'm buying a ticket to an event. It might be at the International Convention Centre, say in Sydney, for example. On the event page, a person who's legally blind, they're going to use a screen reader, which means on their phone, it will read to them what's on the website. Most websites aren't built for that. They're not web accessible. And so when they click text to voice, it doesn't read it in the right order. It misses things because maybe something was text in an image as opposed to text on a readable text um, tool. We've built our platform to be web accessible and also to with a module on the back and that teaches the event organizer how to cater to accessibility and what the questions are that they should be asking. So for example, at the ICC, the International Convention Center, it's not enough to know the location because if you've ever been there, it's like two kilometers wide um, and there's lots of different areas in it. And it's hard enough when you've got your vision to find the small conference that you're going to there at any given day. And so if you're blind catching an Uber there and you need to tell your Uber driver, drop me off specifically here. So you need more than just a Google Maps address. And so we have eight questions the event organizer can fill out that give someone with a disability the confidence and information they need to successfully attend an event without it blowing out into a disaster. Mm -hmm. It's now evolved to like, event organizers who might be blind, for example, or vision impaired is the right way to say it, um, actually able to use the back end of our software to manage their events. And that's pretty cool. And uh, we've got future ideas um, and things we're implementing but aren't really working yet. Like, uh, you know, you can search events on our website and if you're in a wheelchair, you can filter by wheelchair access. And that's a really nice thing if you're in a wheelchair because you don't have to waste time looking at events that don't actually facilitate you entering the event and you know that's not used that much yet because people don't know that much about it and so you know there's more work to be done on this but we're, we're on that journey hmm. for someone who is for example not vision impaired i imagine that you will need to really understand the world of an visually impaired person to in order to build something that will be useful how did you go about designing and finding out how to build and design for this segment. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you a little story. So um, I think it was like five, six years ago now, um, uh, Chief Technology Officer and my co-founder Adam went to a Microsoft hackathon on accessibility. And so in that room were a bunch of disability groups, the Australian Network on Disability, Vision Australia, as well as a range of people who were invited along who have different accessibility requirements. One of the people there, his name is Rocco, he's legally blind. Our CTO and my co-founder got there and they're like, look, we don't know much about disability. We're here to learn. We thought this would be an interesting event. We know that accessibility is a challenge at live events. So we're, we're here to see if we can make a difference. But everyone else in the room was experts in accessibility or directly impacted by it. They did a whole bunch of design workshops and interviews with people at the event. And within the multi-day hackathon, it actually worked out that the main reason people with disabilities don't go to live events is because they don't get the information they need. And as the ticketing platform, you sit between the patron and the event organizers. Mm -hmm. You're the disseminator of information. So we actually have a big role to solve here. Um, and so they built and shipped and released a solution for that in the two-day event. We ended up winning the hackathon, even though we were complete outsiders with no experience. And that kind of really set us on the journey. And Rocco, who was vision impaired at that event, he ended up helping us quite a lot, as did Australian Network and Disability and Vision Australia. Just got closer to the issue and more excited by the opportunity to solve the problem of social inclusion. And there's government studies that show the issues reported by people with disabilities. And social inclusion and community participation is one of the most highly ranked, uh, highly reported, sorry, issues. Um, and so events obviously lie at the heart of social inclusion. And so... Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting thing to solve with technology because it needs technology to solve it. I don't think I've ever seen a company that 
or perhaps because I'm not in, in that segment, I can see. <laughs> so I'm not as aware, but it seems like not many companies out there actually go through the effort to make their platforms more accessible. Why is it important to you to actually make your platform as inclusive as possible? Yeah, so you're right, they don't, most. Just before I get to answering a question, there's a group in America called Nobility, um, one of the world's leaders in web accessibility. And a lot of their staff have accessibility requirements with vision impairments and stuff. And they actually reached out to us to thank us for building the world's first accessible registration platform because they had been asking the, our competitors to do it for years with no luck. They'd even pitched philanthropists to say, help us build this, no luck. And we've sold it for them. So they, they've written some really nice articles about it and they use us now in, in, um, in North America. But yeah, so why do we do it? A couple of reasons. One is um, a big part of our vision is this concept of humane technology. Technology is the biggest driver of change in the world. If we can create technology charities at scale that exist to solve social problems, then well, that's what we're all about. That's the world we want to create. And so here's a tangible real world example we can solve. And because we're in the event space, it's core to what we do. And we don't see it as a cost, which if we had shareholders, it would be a cost. And that's why our competitors don't solve it because it's more cost than it is revenue necessarily. The same way providing domestic violence shelters for victims of domestic violence is a cost. And so you don't see businesses running domestic violence shelters. Um, it's a cost. You're not doing it for a return necessarily. And we want it to be sustainable. And we're lucky that we have a ticketing revenue stream from the events more broadly because we don't have to answer to shareholders. We can prioritize social issues. And how important are partners? I've heard you mention quite a few of them as you are talking. Yeah, massive. Um, I mean, in the accessibility space, we would have um, not known what to do if it wasn't for groups like Vision Australia and Australian Network on Disability and now Mobility in the US. And there's more, I'm not doing it justice. Then with the Humanities ticketing platform, like Atlassian in particular, have been our biggest partner, not just funding us, but we get amazing access to their talent and staff. And they're one of the best companies in, in the world, definitely Australia. And so, for example, next week, I'm speaking to their head of PR, who's going to be helping us with our PR strategy. And uh, this morning, I spoke to one of their um, finance treasury, very senior employees. I don't know the, her exact title, but she was helping me with uh, some of our international finance challenges as we scale globally. Mm. And so they've been like an absolute game changer as a partner. We won the Google Impact Challenge in 2018. They were very helpful and still are some of their staff. And uh, I think as a charity, you know, coming back to your earlier question of why a charity not a for-profit, We'd have a lot, be getting a lot less out of our partnerships if we were a for profit. I think people are a lot more generous to us in, in what they give and what and the spirit of the engagement mm. because they appreciate that this is a hundred percent for purpose. Mm. If it wasn't, rightfully so, they'd want their pound of flesh back. And we get a lot of people helping us and giving us a leg up because uh, they really believe in what we're doing and recognize the structure as part of that. Mm. For humanities. What kind of impact would you hope to be making in five to 10 years time? Yeah, so, I mean, our ultimate vision is a world where businesses, structures, systems work in harmony um, with humanity to serve the interests of our people and our planet, as opposed to just making shareholders rich. <laughs> um, and so, you know, right now, if you look in Australia and New Zealand, we are at a run rate today of giving about $2 million a year sustainably to our education programs. And so in three to five years time, we'd like to have this working in North America and the UK as well. And we'd like that number to be more like 10 to 20 to $30 million a year going into our program sustainably. And so that's a kind of our mid medium term target, as well as vastly improving accessibility at live events for people with disabilities. If we can be there in three years, four years, be very happy. What kind of capabilities do you think you will need to build up over the next few years for you to be able to do that? Growing into North America, we need access to capital. Because we're structured as a charity, that's quite hard. So we're dependent on grants and philanthropy to get it going. So in Australia and New Zealand, we don't need philanthropy anymore. But next couple of years, scaling this in North America and the UK, we'll need some more money to get it going. We will need great people. And so we're right now aggressively hiring in our sales teams, both in Denver, Colorado and Sydney, Australia, where our main sales teams are. Yeah, we need great people, great developers, capital, ideally great PR. Um, you know, the more people that hear about this, the quicker it grows, the less money we need to grow it because it organically grows that way. 
So those are kind of the, the key, I wouldn't call them roadblocks, but challenges where we're solving in the next few years, as well as obviously scaling from a team of roughly 35 of us today to you know what will probably turn into 70 to 100 in the next three years. What's a question that people should ask you more about that they don't seem to ask you? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, it's such a tough question. I think the biggest misconception out there is that people think doing the right thing has to cost extra. Right. So we've worked really hard to make Humanitics an amazing product. We've literally got our own amazing engineering team, but then we've also got like the best engineers at Atlassian and then people at Google helping. So we've built this amazing piece of software that if you're a for-profit event organizer, it's the best thing for you. And you just, people assume that, oh, well, when you're good in the world, you've got to pay extra. That's actually not the case with us. So our fees are lower than our major competitors and you get to do the right thing. And so I think a lot of people don't get that. People don't ask that question. People don't think that's even possible. Why do you think that is? Think of everything that you can do as a consumer that's good for the world. It generally costs more. So you want to buy a shirt that's not made in a sweatshop. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Higher labor rates, you pay more. You go into the supermarket and you look for the organic stuff that's apparently good for you and good for the world. It costs more. And so there's not many global examples where that's not true. And humanities is one of those examples. I think another great example in Australia would be Good Start Early Learning. They're a non-for-profit provide childcare services to young families. They're the biggest operator in Australia and are the best operator, in my opinion. Uh, really good educational outcomes for the kids. As far as I understand, they charge a fair market rate for what they provide. They're not charging an ethical premium because they're a non-for-profit. And a lot of parents that put their kids in their childcare centers don't even realize they're dealing with this amazing ethical non-for-profit in an industry that has lots of for-profits that don't get the same educational outcomes. These examples do exist, but I think it's just, we're so used to seeing in our normal consumer life that if you want to, you know, if you want to fly ethically, you've got to pay more to offset the carbon off, right? <laughs> so here we've turned every ticket in the world into social impact and it actually costs less. We should win the really good people and the people who are, don't care, but just want the best value. And, um, and so I think that gets lost and people love what we do, but they don't even realize that, Hey, we've done it for you. We've made the world a better place and we've saved you money. Mm. Is there a way, a simple way for us to start changing that perception? Yeah, I think we need more social enterprises at scale that philosophically say for us to work well, we need to have the best service or value for whoever our client is. Good start early learning. Don't market as themselves as use us because we're a non-for-profit. They say, use us because we're the best educators of your children. And that's what matters. We say use humanity because we've got the best software, the best customer service, and it does good for the world. But people don't just use us because we do good for the world. They use us because the product's great. So we need more case studies of this. Like I think thank you are doing a good job. Who gives a crap are doing a good job? But it's still a cottage industry emerging. There's not many that people are aware of. And then to complicate that, there's a lot of greenwashing. Center per cent of a cent goes to this water project. Lots of brands taking advantage of customers' desire to do good in a disgenuine way that doesn't necessarily make the world a better place when you look at the whole transaction. Right. Like maybe there's really bad things going on in the supply chain and a percent of a cent doesn't come close to offsetting that. So we have a bit of a tradition where we ask all of our speakers three key questions. The first one is tell us a story only you can tell. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Uh, I'll tell you the story of um, friendship between me and Adam and how that enabled us to, to do what we're doing with Humanitics. While we were at university in our final year, we were, um, we were lucky enough to save up some money and go to Sri Lanka. And I went for three months, I think Adam too. And uh, while we were over there, we were doing some awesome hiking. And um, it was in 2009, just after the Civil War had finished in Sri Lanka, that had gone on for 30 years. And um, we were hiking in this area and we found this house that was abandoned. The roof was, I don't know if it was damaged or blown off, but it was not there. It was getting to nightfall, so we went up on the roof and we were under this beautiful starlit sky in the middle of this forest. We got a little bonfire going. We're chatting about our, our lives back in Sydney and what we're going back to because we we're finishing our degrees and we're going to the corporate world. And we, we were talking about this vision that we had of what we want to do with our time and, and um, reflecting that, you know, a lot of, it's not unique to us. A lot of people are idealistic when they're at university. What's going to happen when we get back to Sydney is that we're very likely going to get comfortable in a job. Maybe we'll have a child or get a mortgage and 
feel a greater responsibility to something other than ourselves. Um, and that will limit our freedom to, to roll the dice. And we thought that's, that's probably a, a trap, if you'd call it, that lots of people fall into, even though they had a, a vision of what they'd do with their careers in time that was different to what they end up doing. And so we identified that the biggest risk to us not doing this dream, um, even though we didn't know exactly how the dream would be executed, was the fear of loneliness. Because stepping away from that comfortable career on your own <laughs> is much harder because around you, all your friends and family are progressing in inverted commas with their mortgages and whatever. And so we made a pact to each other that when one of us came up with an idea that was worth rolling the dice on, we'd both act as one and support each other and rely on our friendship to not let the fear get in the way of chasing our dreams. I highly recommend to people if they're trying to go down this path to put in safety mechanisms that keep them honest to it. And for us, that was our safety mechanism. I could fall back on the fact that Adam, my best friend, was going to be there for me and that I wouldn't be doing that alone because I think it's a lot darker when your idea is failing and all ideas look like they're failing when you start um, to, yeah, to have a friend to lean on. So that's, um, yeah, it's a unique story we had. You know, when you go pitch, they say that it's really important to have a co-founder. Over the years, I've finally understood why it's so important to actually, I mean, you need to have the right co-founder and partner with you. Otherwise, it would also be a disaster. Totally. Having that 3 a.m. panic about your life and where you are going, it's, it's really special to actually have somebody that you can call and share your worries with. So I kind of can understand what you mean by having someone so close to you, someone you can completely trust when you're going through a journey, like building a startup. The other side to it is um, if you've got a good co-founder, like when you're pivoting with your idea, two months of your work might get wasted mm -hmm. or like feel like it's been wasted, mm -hmm. even though you've learned something from it. But when you've got a co-founder, like you might have a really bad week where the whole thing you are working on fails. And then your co-founder turns around, hey, mate, I just got this amazing call with this person. They bring good news in. <laughs> you know, when you're on your own, you're just pushing uphill, falling over all the time. And it's amazing what it does for morale when you've got a co-founder. That's when you take your turns. But, but that just brings things out of nowhere that make you feel so much better and that this might actually work. Startup journey is really it's like a psychological marathon. <laughs> you just totally. don't keep turning. Yeah. Totally. Uh, second question is teach us a lesson only you can teach. Yeah, so um, I'll stay on the theme of me and friendship. But uh, when we started, we, we created a rule. If uh, you're doing anything that annoys me and I've become conscious of it, I have to raise it straight away. So it might be that um, this is not a real one, but that Adam's always leaving his coffee cup dirty. And it's the end of the day and I take it to the dishwasher. And he's not even realizing I'm doing that, but it's it, it's annoying. That's a small, petty, easy one to raise, but it might be something much more substantial. Like, hey, whenever we're pitching, I find you talk over me and it's really hard to get my point across because you keep interrupting me. And that's actually a really hard thing to raise with someone because most people avoid conflict. But the view was if we raise things early, there won't be animosity that builds in this relationship. We'll deal with all problems, the start of problems before they become problems. And we need to do that because otherwise we're going to have so much pressure on us that even small things will lead to us blowing up at each other. And so we've just nipped every problem in the bud straight away by raising it early. It's kept us really close and communicating really well together. And I actually realize it's a lesson for life. Like you should just manage your relationships like that, not just your business relationships. So I try to implement that outside of life, outside of work. That is the best rule we've got in terms of yeah. working well as a team. I was going to say it sounds like something that people probably should apply to <laughs> friendships and relationships and, you know, family conversations. <laughs> probably solve a lot of problems. Yeah. <laughs> and the closing question is about your vision for the future. It's about envisioning 2050 and what would you hope it to look like, feel like, and sound like? Yeah, thanks. I, I, I alluded to it at the start of this interview, but it was... um. You know, that vision of a world where like businesses and structures actually work in harmony with humanity and put human and our planet interests first. And so that's the broader vision we're trying to, we're trying to, we're hoping that the world will be at it 2050, obviously not the whole world, but like we want lots more examples of social enterprises showing how you can have an organization that does so much good and, and works in harmony with those different elements of, of the world, not just, you know, shareholder profit. That's not to say that business that's for profit can't do a lot of good. Um, and I think capitalism's lifted more people out of poverty than any other system before. Mm -hmm. but it would be a real shame if we were to say 
the evolution of capitalism stops here, <laughs> that we can't do it better. I hope humanitics is an example of a social unicorn, we call it, which is a, a technology company that's scaled to, you know, if we were a for-profit, we'd be valued at billions of dollars, but instead of um, that going to shareholders, it's going to the world's poorest children and helping close the education gap. And and if we can prove that, that that can be happen or someone else can prove that along this journey side with us, that'd be an awesome contribution. Well, thank you so much for your time, Josh. I know that previous interviewers have said that speaking with you has been really, really inspiring. Listening to your story actually reminded me of two things. One is how important it is to have conviction so when you feel like when you have that feeling in your guts that you really want to do something that can possibly impact the world it is important to have the courage to actually do that um, because it is, it is actually a position of privilege to be able to choose to do something that can impact other people's lives and the second thing is the importance of micro actions right like your platform every cent makes a difference and every single product that we buy when we go to the supermarket makes a difference. When we choose one product over another, we are actually choosing to invest in different companies and the way that they operate within, within society. So yeah, so thank you so much for sharing your time and uh, I really enjoyed having a chat with you. My pleasure and thanks for, your, thanks for featuring me and, and Humanitics. And yeah, really enjoyed the conversation.